As he says, I'm talking about building images for the secure pie chain. Uh, I'm a product manager at ChainGuard and I work on our images product. Um, I think it's fair to say that people, and by people I mean the public and politicians, are not very happy with the state of security in IT in general. Um, and it's actually got serious enough that politicians are now actually doing something and writing acts and executive orders to try and encourage some improvement. And you can kind of understand why. This was the, the Sonatype report that came out a few days ago or a week ago or so. Um, and they claim 742% average growth rate in supply chain attacks. I think this is uh, like, like malicious packages found in, in package repositories. So things like typo, squat, typo squatting attacks and similar. But at any rate, it certainly goes to show there are problems uh, and they're growing and we need to try to address them. Um, my basic thesis here is that things are, are kind of broken at the minute. We certainly could be doing a lot better than we are at the minute. Um, one of the things that I think is definitely room for improvement is the state of provenance. So, you know, this is a sneaker that is <laughs> clearly a converse knockoff. Um, but at the minute, it's very hard to tell when you have an image where that image came from. Generally, people uh, base this on the name of the image. Because typically, the name of the image includes like the, the repository and the registry it came from. So I might trust this image because it looks like it's a Docker official image. Or I might trust this image because the name indicates it came from my, um, my own organization's registry. But actually proving that it came from there or it was built by the people you think built it is another question, and that's not really answered at all um, by most people, or answerable by most people. Yeah, and similarly, we can't prove that things haven't been tampered with, either you know, in transit or at rest or wherever. Um, there's also a separate point about reproducibility. So even if I have like the Docker file and the source used to create an image, typically if I run a Docker build again, I'll end up with a very slightly different image because there'll be things like different timestamps, uh, and build IDs and things like that will be different, which means I end up with a, 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 an image that is bitwise not identical. Um, scanning is a big problem. So we have these great tools, things like Sneak, Trivi, Gripe, um, and they're really useful and they're very powerful, but they give us a lot of output um, for the majority of images. Uh, and the thing is, most organizations, they don't really know what to do with this output. Um, you know, you get like 100 vulnerabilities or 200 vulnerabilities. What are you meant to do with that? I mean, you don't have time to go and investigate each one. And even if you do, but next week there's a dozen more. Um, so it's a very difficult situation we're scanning at the moment. And on a similar topic, it's very hard to gauge exposure. So say like a, a new vulnerability drops tomorrow, that looks quite important. We would like to be able to say, hey, you know, I have four containers running in production that potentially expose this vulnerability. But we can't, and nobody really can. Um, and that's definitely an area that we hope to, to move forward in, in as an industry uh, in the near future. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna talk about some approaches to trying to fix some of these problems. So a lot of this is what we can do today. Um, there is also a little bit about what's coming in the future uh, and what we're kind of working on. So provenance, um, this is a Detroit deep dish pizza. Um, so in terms of provenance, you wouldn't want to be fooled into accidentally getting a Chicago deep dish pizza. Um, and the way to look at provenance, uh, or one way to improve provenance, is this idea of signing. So we can sign our container images, which lets us prove uh, that we know where they came from and who built them. Uh, the sort of leading way to do this at the moment is Sigstore. Um, and is, we got to the stage where Sigstore is now used to sign all the Kubernetes official images, which is a, a great step forward. Um, a couple of nice things about Sigstore. Uh, one is the signatures are actually stored alongside the images. So you don't need to run a separate server to store your signatures. Uh, and there's also something really nice called keyless signing. So I don't know about you, but I hate having a key pair and I've got to try and keep this private key um, safe and secure and worry about it, et cetera. 
Um, yeah, so I've got a couple of small demos that will hopefully work. If I make this, is that screen still off the side there? Or can you see the whole of that? That's good? Okay. Oh, see, now you can see the magic, so I've got to run the script. I should have run that before. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm going to build a Docker image here. Um, this could go horribly wrong, because although it's like a, automated, um, it does still run the commands. Um, so we're building a simple Docker image. It doesn't really matter too much what's in it. Um, I'm then going to push that to my repository on the Docker Hub. Yeah, so it's got a similar image that already exists, so that was quick. Um, I'm now going to try and sign this with cosign. So as of today, I do have to type cosign experimental equals one to turn on the keyless signing. Um, there may be uh, something about that being fixed in the very near future. Um, and then the image that I want to sign isn't like emote, cosign, colon, Detroit. I really want to sign the digest so that I'm absolutely sure that I'm signing this same image and nobody else has like pushed um, to the Detroit tag in the meantime. Um, so I wish I had time to go into the details of how this all works, uh, but I'm gonna answer yes here. Um, this has actually opened the browser in the background and it's asking me to authenticate with an OIDC provider. So I, never, I didn't give it like a private key to sign with. And so what it wants to do is use my OIDC credential to set up uh, a temporary certificate behind the scenes. So I'm gonna log in with GitHub. That looks good. And that's gonna push the signature up to the Docker Hub. Uh, there's also some stuff with transparency logs and Wrecker and Fossil that went on in the background. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain all that. And we have Wi-Fi. Oh, there we go. Oh. Did something go wrong? Whoa. I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> I can't, it's in the script. <laughs> so presumably this will fail. Yeah, I think I just timed out. No, no, it didn't. I'm not sure what the error was about there. Uh, so because I rebuilt this image um, and it used the cache version, it actually has the same digest as another image that I already signed. So we got away with this. Um, and what this is saying is I used the GitHub OIDC provider, and it was signed by somebody basically uh, with the authority to access the adrian at adrian.moat.com account on GitHub um, at that point in time. Oh, that's the next thing. <laughs> I'm going forward. Yeah, so as far as image sign goes, please try and use it where you can. Um, if you have a choice of, of, of images, try and use ones that are signed. Um, try out signing with your own images. One thing I didn't talk about is if you use like GitHub Actions or similar to build your images, it's really easy to use the keyless signing because it's already set up with the OIDC account. So really it's just a case of running cosign verify and there's not much else to do and no keys to worry about. Um, yep, make sure you verify signatures. There's no point in just signing things. We also need to be checking the signatures. And a typical way to do that in a Kubernetes cluster is to use a policy management tool, such as OPA or Caverno or TrainGuard Enforce. Um, also, if you get images from a third party vendor, um, do ask them if they've signed their images. Um, you know, try and encourage them to sign their images. Um, scanner noise. So this is going back to the problem of like hundreds of vulnerabilities being reported. Um, it is possible to you know, cut this noise down drastically and get to the point where your reports are only, if they're you know, finding any vulnerabilities, it's only a handful that you can cope with. And basically the answer is to cut your images down to the very minimum set of dependencies and to keep those dependencies absolutely up to date all the time. Um, there's also, in the future, there's something called the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange that I'll talk about later, and that may also give us a way to like filter um, vulnerabilities through that and cut the noise down even further. 
Um, so the first way to cut down your dependencies is to use smaller base images. Uh, the easiest way that you can probably do with just changing a from line today is to use something like Alpine or Debian Slim. Um, and that can be a good alternative to using something like the full Debian distribution. Uh, but you do find there's still quite a lot of stuff in there, even with Alpine and Debian. I mean, Alpine's probably only 55 megabytes, and I think Debian Slim's about 50. So there's still quite a few potentially vulnerable components in there. Um, the other thing about these distros is that updates sometimes take time. Because what you have to wait for is the upstream to either release a new version with a fix or to release a patch. And then the distribution needs to um, update their package. And then you need to wait for the image built from those packages to be updated. So typically, you know, that's going to take a week or two before vulnerabilities are addressed. Um, we can cut things down a lot further if we look at things like Google Container Tools distroless images. Um, I'm sure some of you have, have seen these. Uh, these are like really small. So these images, um, they contain a bit more than Scratch, right? So they do have a few things in them, typically like a, a temp directory, like TLS certificates, so you can actually talk to two websites. But the slim, you know, they, they cut down to the extent they won't even have a shell or a package manager inside them. So you won't be able to do things like apt install and things like that. Um, they're perfect for running things like uh, statically compiled binaries that you can do with like Go or C or Rust. Um, they also, Google also has a couple of images, I think one for Java, maybe one for Python. So you can run dynamic stuff like that as well. Uh, but there are some drawbacks. Typically, the Google Container Tools risk list, this list of is kind of hard to extend. Um, even though it's um, based on Debian, so it's like a really stripped down form of Debian, um, and you would like to think you could like apt install stuff, but doing that is actually kind of difficult, and you'll end up having to play with Basil if you want to create your own versions. So uh, at ChainGuard, uh, we basically created uh, our own base images using a very similar technique to GCT distroless. So we have base images um, that are completely slimmed down um, to the extent that they don't have a package manager or shell as well. But um, we build our images with something called APKO, uh, and it's easy for us to extend these images and add in whatever we like. So we have both um, base images in the same sense as the, GC, as the GCT distroless ones, but also some application images, so things like Nginx, uh, and a Git image that I'll show you in a second. Um, all our images also come with S-bombs, um, but importantly, we continuously are updating these images. So we're pulling from, and getting the latest sources and recompiling every night and building new images. So hopefully, all vulnerabilities should be addressed as quickly as we can. Um, we basically have two flavors of images at the minute. There's images built from using Alpine packages, but there's also images built using packages from our own distribution called Wolfie, um, which is built against glibc. So now you can get very minimal glibc images as well as uh, muzzle build ones. And I wish I had more time to go into um, Wolfie, but that'll be for another time. Um, so I want to quickly demonstrate sort of what I mean in practice. So if we look at the Nginx images in the Docker Hub, and I run sneak or trivior gripe, against them. This, the Nginx latest image, I think that uses Debian by default, not even Debian Slim. Um, and I, last time I ran it, uh, this found, yeah, 143 dependencies. So there's a lot of components in there, and there was 94 problems. Now, admittedly, the vast majority of these things are gonna be, oh, that's critical, but the mass, vast majority are gonna be like negligible and so on. But all the same, it's stuff, vulnerabilities that you know, you've got to look at and think about and deal with, and it'd be much simpler if they simply weren't there. Um, so we can do one better if we look at the Alpine image. Uh, and you know, so this one had 143 dependencies. The Alpine image only has 43 dependencies. So, so there's 100 less components in the Alpine image than there is in the Debian image, for whatever reason. Um, it still found two issues, um, apparently to do with libxml library. Um, finally, I run it against the chain guard image. Uh, this is one of our Alpine images, but um, 
we're using our own build of Nginx from the source. Um, and this case is actually 46 dependencies, so some, some things are getting pulled and it shouldn't be, I need to fix that. Um, but there are no vulnerable paths found, and I did look at this, and the reason is purely that we're using a newer version of lib libxml for some reason. I'm not actually sure why the Alpine one hasn't updated yet. Um, yeah, and the way we do this is using our own uh, tool called Apco to build our images. Um, it's designed to be reproducible, so if you run the same build twice, you should get the same image out. Um, it's declarative. Um, uh, and basically all you do is you say, I want to use this APK repo, and I want to install these packages. And that's basically all you do. Um, there's no equivalent to the run in Dockerfile. So you can't run like random things to build up the image. You have to, your only choice way to get files into the image is to install them via APK. Um, and that's basically what allows us to get to reproducibility and so on. So, let's have a demo of that. It worked. Yeah, I'm gonna change to a directory um, with a git image inside it. So this is the apco file um, to build the git image. Um, and yeah, this is the, the crux of it. We're saying we want to use the Alpine packages in this case. Uh, and we want to install these packages inside the container, or the image rather. Um, there's also a little bit of metadata, like entry points and work there, uh, and set them user accounts, but that's really all there is. Um, this is the same file, but using um, Wolfie base, so like a glibc version. Um, and again, it's almost identical. We're just saying what packages we want to install, but this time we're using Wolfie packages. Um, I'm gonna, I've got the small build script. Um, so one thing with APKO or APCO is it does use Alpine tooling. So it's much easier for me on my Mac to use a container to run, to run APCO than it is to try and run it locally. Uh, yeah, so th what this is gonna do is build the, the Alpine version, call it get local, and output it to something called output.tar. So. Hopefully this works, it might take a second. Um, and what this is gonna do is um, build the output.tar file containing our image and also create an SBOM. Hopefully this will work. Tick tock. It's a Wi-Fi problem. Probably why the other thing didn't work as well. Okay, I think this might be cr not work. It's not looking good. Okay, I might have to kill that in the interest of time. How do I go back? Well, it keeps going anyway. So I think there's still, hopefully there's still files from a previous run. Um, there is like, a, will I put an SBOM? Um, and that SBOM of like sort of complete details of all the packages inside that image. Um, we can then load that into Docker, the Docker load command. Or normally what you do is just push it straight up to a container registry. Um, so what I was gonna show is you know, that's the file that comes out. Um, you got an old version there. And I was gonna show, um, if you run SHA sum, we get the exact SHA for the file. Um, and then if I run it again, which of course won't work again, um, you should end up with identical output.tar, but a newer timestamp on the file. So idea being shown that it does, that it is reproducible. Um, at the moment, this only works with Alpine-based images. There's some bug somewhere in the, the glibc build. Um, that means that's not always reproducible. So that's why I'm using Alpine build. We will fix the glibc issue, so hopefully it will both be completely reproducible. Stop that. Um, yeah, this will work, but it's only, I didn't actually build it twice. That's an old file. Okay, and that would have been a demo.
Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was vulnerability exploitability exchange. As, as many people heard of that. I, mean, I guess we're at CloudNet Security Con. Can you put your hand up? Yeah. So, because of the audience, like a, you know, at least a third of you have heard of it. Um, basically, it's a standard file format um, currently being discussed. Uh, and it basically gives a way for vendors to say, um, yeah, we're aware that scanners are, are saying that the uh, this product software or this image or whatever contains CVE XYZ. Um, but actually, you don't need to worry about this because it's not um, exposed in this container or actually it's a false positive and we don't have the vulnerable version of the software or something like that. Uh, and the idea is that by cross-referencing like the scanner vulnerability report and VEX, um, you should be able to further cut down the amount of noise from our, from our scanner reports. Um, the final bit I wanted to talk about um, is exposure. So what I really hope happens in the future, and I certainly think this is possible, is that if all our images have complete S-bombs, so at the minute if you, if you use tools, um, at the sort of current level of tooling won't cover most, the com entirety of most images. You quite often find like, a, for example, <laughs> I'm trying not to name names, but most of the, the tools to generate S-bombs at the minute run after the fact, and they just interrogate the package manager. And so they can miss things like, um, for example, if you look at the, the Redis image in Docker Hub, uh, Redis itself um, is installed by downloading it from the, the Redis website. It's not installed via the package manager. So tools like Sift and so on that try and create the S-bomb won't actually see that. And she'll have an incomplete S-bomb that is actually missing the most important package inside there. Um, so that's one thing that needs to improve. But really, I would like to see the creation of S-bombs push back to whoever's building the software. So in the cases of like a Docker file building image, it should really be the S-bombs created at that point and not afterwards. Um, but assuming you do have a complete S-bomb that includes all dependencies and transitive dependencies, um, if we stick all the S-bombs for all our containers in a database and we cross-reference that with uh, CVE information, then theoretically we should be able to instantly tell our exposure to a, a CVE. Uh, so that's kind of what I, I hope happens in the future. Um, but we'll see if they actually get there. Um, so <laughs> that demo was a little bit quicker than expected. Uh, but to wrap up, uh, there's three things I kind of want to talk about. Uh, one with provenance, please look into signing your images if you're not already uh, and verifying um, signatures on the images you're using. Uh, it is a lot easier now than it used to be. Um, scanner noise, uh, the way to defeat scanner noise or, or get around the problem is to just aggressively reduce the, the number of dependencies in your images and using chain guard images can be a good way to do that. Uh, and also to keep your images as updated as possible. Um, to be honest, I think that's one of the key things we need to do as an industry is to keep things updated all the time. I know there's um, a reluctance, especially at, at larger organizations, to update sometimes because you update and things break. But if you don't update, you know, you get hacked. So there's not really a very good choice there. Uh, and finally, regarding like figuring out our exposure, uh, well, we're not really there yet, but hopefully the future does lie and stuff like S-bombs and VEX. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we have some time for questions. Oh, one over there. Oh. Check. Oh, thanks. Hey, um, is there any like products right now to use VEX or that's totally in the future right now? Oh. Well, okay, uh, I'll let you take the mic in a second. Um, but uh, at ChainGuard, I was hoping to do a demo of something called VexCTL that we're working on, but it's, it's not really there yet. Basically, the idea is, um, you know, you run VexCTL and you'll have like a Vex document alongside the container, and then you can filter down the, the results. But I'm not really aware of any too many tools, but you're... Oh, there's an OWASP, the OWASP tools, the dependency tracker, apparently is using VEX. But 
I'm sure there's still a lot of discussion and stuff going on with VEX. So, another question? There's one there. Is there a competitive like reason if you're going to enforce that everything's coming from a certain repo that you're confident on the access controls to also sign and require things that are signed? Yeah, yeah, th there is. Um, so I guess one thing would be, you know, you still got to account for the time between an image being downloaded and run. Um, so you know, somebody could tamper with it in between, for example. I think you can probably say more complicated things with signatures. I mean, one thing I didn't talk about was attestations. So you can start adding attestations to say, like, oh, the tests were run against this image, or this image is, you know, um, suitable for running in production, or only suitable for running in staging, and things like that. So you can get a bit more complicated. Okay. So any other questions? Oh, there's one over there. Uh, is it uh, possible to uh, reproduce, reproduce APK art uh, when the Alpha Linux upstream uh, removes uh, all version of APK package? Uh, so when you run uh, APK art twice with AppCore, uh, can you uh, reproduce the uh, exact same image? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, so uh, when you run AppCore twice, yeah. uh, between the first run and the second run, uh, the Alpine package versions uh, might be different. That's right. Uh, so uh, is it possible to uh, reproduce uh, the purchases uh, with the old version? Yeah, no, you're quite right. Uh, so the, the point is, like, in that AppCo file, I was just, like, specifying packages. I wasn't specifying exact versions of packages. Um, one thing we're looking at is basically we'll have some form of pinning, so you can pin to an exact version of a package. So at the, at the moment, we don't have a good story there. You're quite right. If, a, if it was to happen that a package was updated, you'd end up with a different image. But in the future, we, we will have pinning, so. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I, I'm working uh, very similar to, uh, so I'll open a uh, GitHub issue right there. Uh, thanks. Is it anything else? We're good? Okay. So, well, thank you all.